My name is Margot Landman. I'm Deputy Vice President for Programs at the National Committee on US-China Relations. And I'm delighted to welcome all of you to our webinar today and to welcome our speakers who are going to give us a wonderful presentation and discussion on China and Southeast Asia. A thanks to my colleagues who are working behind the scenes to make all of this possible. We have, this is the third in a series of national committee events on China and Southeast mm -hmm. Asia. The first was last week, a book program with Mike Lampton. He and his co-authors examine the high-speed rail project or projects between China and Southeast Asia that comprise part of the Belt and Road Initiative about which we will hear more shortly. The second program earlier this week featured five experts, two Chinese and three Americans, discussing US-China maritime conflict and dispute management in the South China Sea. That is also highly relevant to what we're going to hear about today. I will turn the program over shortly to Anne-Marie Murphy, but I did want to show you the book that will be discussed today called The Deer and the Dragon. And we will hear why it has that interesting title. Anne-Marie is a professor of political science at Seton Hall University in New Jersey. And she will get us started. She will then be followed by the editor of the volume, Professor Don Emerson, who's at Stanford. And then there will be a conversation between the two of them before we go to Q&A. And one more thank you before I turn the floor over to Anne-Marie. We are grateful to Stanford University's Shorenstein Asia Pacific Research Center and the New York Southeast Asia Network for co-sponsoring the event. Over to you, Anne-Marie. Well, thank you very much, Margot, and thank you to the National Committee on um, US-China Relations for this uh, opportunity to be here with you today and to uh, talk with my old friend, Don Emerson, about his new book. Um, as Margot referenced, there are a whole slew of new books on Southeast Asia and China. Um, and as a matter of fact, three of them with very similar focus have just come out. Um, we have Murray Hebert's Under the Dragon's Shadow, or excuse me, Under Beijing's Shadow. We have Sebastian Strangio's uh, In the Dragon's Shadow. And then of course we have Don's Deer and the Dragon, the cover of which Margot just showed you. Um, and all three books make significant contributions to our understanding of um, Chinese Southeast Asian uh, relations, um, not only historically, but particularly since um, Xi Jinping's ascendancy to power and his adoption of a much more assertive foreign policy um, rather than the Deng Xiaoping uh, bide your time, hide your strength uh, dictum. And I want to say that Murray and Sebastian are both longtime journalists who uh, take a very similar approach. Um, they have an introductory chapter with a discussion of China's both historical and more contemporary policy towards Southeast Asia, followed by chapters uh, on individual countries and how they're responding to both the challenges and opportunities that China's growing economic military power and desire for uh, political predominance in Southeast Asia creates for them. Um, and they are excellent books. Don took a very different approach. Um, Number one, this book is an edited volume and Don recruited 14 of the world's leading experts on various uh, aspects of Chinese foreign policy, Chinese economic ties with Southeast Asia, uh, Southeast Asian policies towards China. And in contrast to many authors or editors who impose a certain structure on the book, or 
demanded that a certain set of questions must be answered in their individual chapters, Don granted the authors leeway in their chapters within their area of expertise to grapple with the key issue of asymmetry in size, wealth, and power that is implied by the title, The Deer and the Dragon. Um, and so we get fascinating chapters um, on Chinese perceptions of Southeast Asia, both public opinion polls, as well as what it means to think of Chinese views of Southeast Asia as its backyard. We get very interesting arguments by leading economists like Ann Booth, who challenges the um, proposition that uh, China has won the game economically uh, in Southeast Asia. And we get very nuanced views of how Southeast Asian states view these challenges and opportunities within them. Now, very often edited volumes don't always hang together, um, but this one does um, because all of the authors focused on the ways in which asymmetry and conversely, a desire on the part of Southeast Asian states to retain their autonomy despite the disparities in size, economic wealth and power that exists in their relationship with um, Southeast Asia. Uh, and so I really have to credit Don um, as the editor uh, for managing um, to create such a fascinating set of chapters that are extremely diverse and yet take such fascinating cuts at such an interesting and critically uh, important topic. I know that's no easy feat, so, um, so kudos to you, Don. Um, so I think what I would like to do at this point um, is to ask, is to turn it over to Don and let him speak. I want to say that the first chapter in the volume is Don's, and it's on this issue of trying to unpack asymmetry and autonomy. And uh, it has an extremely analytical argument, those of you who know Don knows he loves arguments, um, particularly analytical ones that allow us to kind of uh, use these arguments and apply them in uh, new scenarios and unfolding uh, events. And in my view, that chapter is worth the price of the book. So at this point, I think I've spoken long enough. Um, Don, over to you, please. Well, thank you. Thank you so much, Anne-Marie. That, <clears throat> that was undeserved. Uh, but welcome, nevertheless, uh, very welcome indeed. I'm glad that you like the book and uh, I appreciate your comments because it was a somewhat uh, distinctive enterprise. Uh, and I'm, I'm glad that in your opinion, it, it seems to have, have worked out. Um, okay, uh, rather than delve into all of the various arguments that the authors made, and I think you and I will have a chance in our conversation and also in the Q&A uh, to go into a number of those arguments. Let me perhaps begin um, with a kind of a reflection on the difficulty of dealing with this topic and all of the dimensions that it, that it has. Um, you know, in, in, in some ways, I suppose if, uh, you know, if this were written for a purely academic audience, right? Uh, the title might be something like, you know, complicating asymmetry, right? <laughs> you know, now, you know, somebody sees that on a book, in a bookstore, not that they exist much anymore, but at least online on Amazon, right? They're gonna say, well, forget that. I think I can do without that title. Uh, so I avoided that and tried it instead to represent asymmetry in the two figures of the deer and the dragon. It's a metaphor, and like any metaphor, it, it, it runs out of utility if you overuse it. <laughs> um, just, just for clarity's sake, this is not the deer in Hollywood. It's not Bambi, uh, obviously. Uh, it is the mouse deer. And I do want to identify the mouse deer as actually existing in reality. They have been seen and found, right? I mean, not only in the Malayo-Polynesian part of Southeast Asia, but even in Vietnam. Uh, I'm not saying that this is a kind of a national or international mascot uh, in the region, 
but the thing about the the mouse deer is that the mouse deer has been uh, made mythological in a literature, a folk literature that dates back for some time, in which the mouse deer, essentially for the purposes at least of the book, um, is thought to defeat the dragon, not because the mouse deer has strength, power, size, wealth, or anything like that, but because of his or her cleverness, that the clever mouse deer it's a little bit, I suppose, you know, the slingshot uh, that, um, that David has uh, dealing with uh, Goliath, how clever, right? Well, if you look at the literature on the mouse deer, Sankancho in the Indonesian phraseology, for example, also in Malaysia, you'll actually find, as I did when I went through a number of these stories, and one I actually uh, excerpted or, or rather condensed in the opening chapter, you'll find that actually, to be perfectly candid, with apologies to my my Southeast Asian colleagues uh, who may identify perhaps a little bit more than I do living far from Southeast Asia with the mouse deer. Actually, the mouse deer often wins, typically wins because of the stupidity of the dragon, not the cleverness of the mouse deer. And you know, one thing to be said is that China under Xi Jinping at the moment doesn't strike me as guilty of stupidity. Uh, I won't talk about the incumbent in the White House in that regard. I'll just, uh, I won't go there. Uh, but in the Chinese case, it seems to me the Chinese foreign policy with regard to Southeast Asia, although it has fluctuated, you know, we had smile diplomacy, we had frown diplomacy. Now we have wolf warrior diplomacy, which seems to be a kind of, you know, uh, a deeper, perhaps more permanent, I don't know, frown, right? Uh, and the chapter that I wrote on the South China Sea, chapter six, actually identifies what I take to be China's goal in the South China Sea, which I'm not necessarily broadcasting to a goal that applies to the entire Southeast Asian region, but certainly in the South China Sea, in my opinion, China wants to control the South China Sea. Now, that statement is contestable. Uh, obviously, the, uh, you know, the, the Chinese embassy in, in Washington or the consulate in San Francisco would probably, I'm sure, would contest uh, that statement. Now, when I say control, what I mean is, I'm trying to be careful. I mean negative control, not positive control. Now, again, I'm an academic, so academics are guilty of inventing words. I mean, I'm not inventing them, but I'm reinterpreting them a little bit. What I mean by positive control is if China had positive control over the South China Sea, nothing would happen in the South China Sea, either on it or underneath it or above it, that was not expressly willed, wanted by China. Now, that's absurd. China has a lot of power. They don't have that much power. Not even the United States, well, especially not the United States from way on the other side of the planet has the kind of power to establish what I call positive control. But negative control is different. Negative control means that if something happens in the South China Sea that is important enough and China doesn't like it, then China can successfully nip it in the bud, either prevent it from happening at all uh, or when it begins to happen, to manage to stop it. That's what I mean by negative control. And our listeners and watchers can interpret that as they wish, and they can think of precise examples in which would, would illustrate the difference between positive and negative control. So I'm talking about negative control. Now, the next thing to be said, and this is really important, especially in a program that has been organized by an organization that is dedicated, as I think many of us are in the academic community, to, if at all possible, having good relations with China, between China and the United States. I am not demonizing China. Uh, I have uh, very early on when I was debating the title and talking to a colleague in the United Kingdom uh, and the response I got, I said, what do you think of this, the deer and the dragon? And he said, Don, no, 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 don't use the dragon. Everybody's using the dragon. It is such a cliche. Everybody says dragon, dragon, dragon. And basically it puts, you know, it puts a target on China's back because dragons are, they have fire coming out of their mouths, they're mean and so forth, right? And I took that very seriously. Uh, I do not want to demonize China in this book. I don't think I am and I don't want to do it. Uh, and if I have done it, I apologize. I don't want to demonize China. But on the other hand, as I worked on it, and this is included in the book, I recalled that when Donald Trump and Xi Jinping were walking through the Forbidden City, right, in Beijing. In their conversation, it was Xi Jinping who volunteered, who said, 
we are the descendants of the dragon. Now, what he meant by that, oh, that's subject to debate. Obviously, I wasn't there. But I, I don't blame either of my co-authors outside of The Deer and the Dragon who wrote those two other books, excellent books. I read them both, which you showed at the, at the beginning in The Dragon's Shadow. The Dragon's Shadow is a kind of, you know, a motif there. And frankly, I don't think that either one of them uh, intended uh, to use that word as a derogatory term. So I want to begin by, by that sort of uh, uh, background. Now, the, the task here is difficult. It involves interpretation, analysis, of course, and actually it does necessarily involve some kind of anticipation, expectation, or to put it in strict terms, prediction. What's going to happen, right? And I want to sketch a spectrum on which I hope our discussion can, can operate without limiting it in any way between on the one hand, a naive and romantic idealism, which from time to time I run across in Southeast Asia, that, oh yes, we are small, but we're smart. Uh, we are creative. Uh, we, we have all kinds of uh, ideas that we're gonna do. We're proactive. We're not just gonna roll over on our backs and let China do whatever it needs to do. That's one extreme. The other extreme is abject fatalism. It's over, forget it. Kishore Mahbubani, who has a very positive view of China, extremely positive, has always had a very positive view of China. And the title of his latest book is Has China Won? And the fatalist would say, you bet it's won. Yes, game over, right? Let's just get used to it, okay? And somewhere between those two extremes are all kinds of possible positions that one can take with regard to the agency of Southeast Asia versus the structural advantages that China enjoys. The ones that you mentioned, demographic size, physical size, economic power, and so forth, right? The size of the People's Liberation Army, uh, Army, Navy, Army, Air Force, I mean, the military power of China. And so, you know, on the one hand, one doesn't want to be romantic. Uh, but on the other hand, are we really at the point where we have to accept that not only in terms of Li Jing, uh, sorry, Li Minjiang's uh, chapter, uh, is Southeast Asia literally, geographically, the backyard of China, but that it will become more than simply descriptively so, but will be incorporated into a greater China. And here it seems to me there's a number of responses one can make. Uh, for example, are we talking about Southeast Asia as a unit? Now, there are 11 countries in Southeast Asia. Timor-Leste, of course, is not a member of the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, ASEAN. Um, and it does not occur uh, really in the book at all. Uh, we don't, uh, I just couldn't include that. The 10 members of the Association of Southeast Asian Nations are often identified as Southeast Asia. So let's just say they are Southeast Asia for the purposes of our conversation today, okay? Now, each of those countries is, is unique. Diversity is extraordinary in Southeast Asia. I would argue that Southeast Asia may well be the most diverse region on the planet. Diverse in, in multiple respects, ecological, physical, geographical, obviously, in terms of coasts and non coast economic, political, cultural, historical, I could go on. How many different countries from Europe and the United States colonized Southeast Asia? At one point, I remember in graduate student, people said, Southeast Asia is a bunch of people facing outward to their colonial metropoles that have nothing in common, right? So it makes sense that one would break that concept down. And obviously, one answer is based on proximity to China and what that means in terms of the demographic movement of PRC citizens into Laos, into Cambodia, that the northern tier of Southeast Asia would be most vulnerable to influence by China and conceivably even over the next 5, 10, 15, 20 years incorporation into a greater China. But on the other hand, if you get into the maritime zone, for all kinds of reasons that we could go into, and I'd be happy to discuss them uh, if the audience is interested, a uh, very different situation uh, in the maritime zone, and that it is possible that the maritime zone will be the least likely to lose its strategic autonomy uh, to China. Now, that's just a hypothesis. I don't have time right now to try to defend it in any kind of detail. Uh, and of course, that's bad news for Southeast Asians who believe in ASEAN, in the unification of the region, right? from those bad old colonial days uh, when the West came ba basically and divided it up, right? And then let me just end on this note. The, the dilemma uh, in just in recent days, uh, I happened to be involved in a webinar 
an off the record webinar, so I, I would rather not uh, identify it, that just brought home to me once again, this, this dilemma of how should Southeast Asians respond to China, right? I mean, the most obvious thing that one can say about a group of entities, countries, individuals, whatever, that are relatively weak and that have tensions among them and face a very, very large, I won't say necessarily adversary, but neighbor who can do them tremendous damage, but I have to admit also can do them, yes, can help them uh, as China. If we have, to be fair, we have to say that some of the economic assistance that China has provided to Southeast Asia has been of significant help in moving the Southeast Asian economies forward. Now, some of the book's uh, chapters argue also that that assistance has increased inequality uh, by catering to corrupt elites in places like Laos and Cambodia. I think we should keep that in mind because that's the other side of the story. But uh, in any case, I think you can see where, where I'm headed. It's, it, makes, oh, damn it, it makes sense for Southeast Asians to unite, right? Uh, Americans are familiar with that, right? United we stand, divided we fall, right? Why has ASEAN been unable to coagulate, to come together, right? To present a common front on a whole range of issues, not just the South China Sea, but you know, the terms of the BRI and so forth, all kinds of issues could be settled, it seems to me, more favorably to Southeast Asia if Southeast Asia had more unity uh, among its uh, 10 member, member countries. And um, as I say, in this webinar just recently, uh, a, a wonderful colleague who unfortunately I'm not able to mention, a Southeast Asian, a sort of magnificent person who is unique in his insistence time and time again in talking to others in the region, his colleagues in the region, uh, to say, you know, look, we've got to solve these problems ourselves before we can face China. And I'll just end on this note. The South China Sea is a dramatic illustration of the inability of Southeast Asia to come together and present a unite front, united front towards China, right? I mean, you know, uh, just recently, Malaysia uh, issues a statement without going into the details to the United Nations with regard to its continental shelf that, you know, yes, ostensibly claims it back from China's claim to everything within the nine dash line, but at the same time overlaps with the Vietnamese claim, right? You know, again, some years ago, there was an effort in Manila to try to bring the four claimants, the four Southeast Asian claimants to the South China Sea together at a meeting in Manila. And you imagine a table, and there were four chairs at the table. And there was always an empty chair until the time the meeting was to begin and the time the meeting was to be, to be finished. There, there, it, the, the fourth party never showed up, right? Uh, and the fourth party happened to be Brunei. Uh, I'm not saying that that is necessarily um, you know, typical of Brunei's foreign policy, but Brunei has in fact not resisted China for various reasons that we could get into. So until the Southeast Asians solve this problem of disunity, can they really compensate, you know, for their, uh, for their smaller size by at least coming together to present a common front to China? The answer up until now is no. Okay, well, Don, thank you very much for uh, expounding on that. I think most of us would agree with you that it is extremely frustrating <laughs> to see the Southeast Asian states um, being unable to, um, to come together. Um, you mentioned Li Mingjiang's uh, chapter, so uh, let, me, let me reference that a little bit and then kind of come back to you on your point about whether or not even escalating threat perceptions of China might force uh, Southeast Asia to come together a bit more. Um, as a scholar of Southeast Asia, I found many of the chapters on China extremely fascinating, perhaps because I was more familiar with um, the material in the Southeast Asia chapters, not that I mean to, um, to downplay them in any way, just more familiar with me. And Li Mingjiang in his chapter on Chinese perceptions of Southeast Asia, you know, makes the proposition that Don referenced that Southeast Asia is China's strategic backyard, right? And that most Chinese analysts and policymakers would agree with that. The question then becomes, what does that mean, right? And as Li says, there, uh, has you know long been this kind of maximalist view, right? That the strategic backyard means that 
China should have control of Southeast Asia, right? That it should be the Monroe Doctrine with Chinese characteristics, that type of positive control that you referenced with uh, the South China Sea. Um, and he notes that to date, um, we haven't seen China really push that hard for that. And he says, in part, if we unpack it, why is that the case? It's because China has a series of interests, right? What do they want in Southeast Asia? They want um, a dependable economic partner, particularly for resources. They want China to enjoy strong influence. They want um, to be able to use the region as a springboard um, for exertion of its soft power, not only in Southeast Asia, but beyond to promote multipolarity. And then critically on the negative side, they wanna ensure that no other country um, plays a predominant role and particularly that the US stays out, right? And the argument that um, Li Minjiang is making is, and he used that word empathy that you used as well, is that China doesn't have a lot of empathy for Southeast Asian states. They don't understand that part of their resistance to some of China's demands is uh, triggered by uh, negative aspects of some of Chinese policies. Um, the aggressiveness in the South China Sea, the negative impacts of some of the BRI projects, et cetera, et cetera. And therefore there's kind of rising frustration in China as they're facing some of this uh, resistance or pushback as Southeast Asian states try to retain their autonomy and that there's a growing consensus in China that they're going to have to be tougher and that when China's looking at Southeast Asia at their strategic backyard and these two traditional values of regional stability and mm -hmm. preservation and promotion of Chinese interests, that the balance is beginning to tip, that there's a greater emphasis being placed on promoting Southeast Asia, or sorry, China's interest, and that it's very likely that China is going to increasingly use force in the region. And so that came as a surprise or illuminating to me. And so I'm curious, obviously we've seen harassment in the South China Sea, right? PLN, fishing fleets. What in your discussions with Li Mingzhang, do you think he really meant by assertion of hard power? And do you think that the Southeast Asian states recognize what he argues is this kind of changing consensus among the Chinese policy elite, what it means for Southeast Asia? And is anybody ready to grapple with it? Well, the honest answer to your question is I have no idea. <laughs> I don't speak Chinese. Obviously, I've traveled in China, but uh, uh, but I can say a couple of things. Um, uh, you know, for, first of all, with regard to China's ambitions uh, in Southeast Asia, um, Tom Finger, uh, who has a chapter in the book, my colleague, uh, who is a bona fide China expert, uh, unlike myself uh, and unlike uh, Ming Zhang, um, he has a very careful uh, understanding of what China wants. And careful in the sense that he argues that China does not want any other country to have more influence in Southeast Asia than China does. Now, you know, to put the most positive spin on that from the standpoint of uh, an American, you know, the idea would be, I suppose, that the United States could have almost as much power as China in Southeast Asia. And, and, and you know, China would be okay with that as long as the United States didn't have more power, right? Uh, there's a version of this when uh, we read, I mean, very recently, for example, uh, just in fact, uh, was it uh, yesterday? Uh, I got an email from, from Kishore, from Kishore Mahubani. He, I'm on his list. He sends his messages out to the entire world. And he's making the argument that we should think of China as being assertive, but not aggressive. And then there's a whole discussion of the difference between, I mean, not that he engages in it as much as I would be inclined to engage in it anyway, 
between being aggressive and being assertive. But I'm not at all sure that we can extrapolate from wolf warrior diplomacy an increasingly hard line in the future. And I say that for several reasons. First of all, the pushback that has come from Southeast Asia on China, although it may have infuriated the Global Times, you know, the raucous patriots, quote unquote, uh, the hyper-nationalists, I, I hope at least, and I think, and others know better than I, that in the, in the offices where foreign policy is actually marinated, if I can put it that way, if not actually made in the mind of Xi Jinping, no, uh, there's a much more rational response. I mean, look at what happened when the feedback uh, against the BRI generated uh, at one of the forums held uh, in China to discuss the BRI, a whole, at least uh, rhetorical anyway, acknowledgement of the need to do things a little differently, right? Uh, the role of the uh, Asian, uh, the investment bank, the AIIB, for example, maybe we should, we should increase that because that's obviously a, a clearer commitment to, uh, I suppose you could say, you know, uh, good economic conduct uh, to honest uh, integrity in terms of the relationships that the BRI has with all of these, frankly, very often highly corrupt and dictatorial elites uh, between China and, uh, and Europe. Uh, and so I think the Chinese leadership is capable of learning. We may be in even perhaps at the beginning of a relative moderation of China's behavior, uh, but I'm not willing to predict that because I don't know enough about China. And I would just add this other point, which I think also my colleague uh, Tom Finger makes very effectively, which is that let's, okay, we concentrate on foreign policy. And people who work on policy, you know, whatever you work on, you tend inevitably in the course of your career to believe it's the most important thing on earth. And we need a little modesty, right? Domestic politics, domestic economics. Look at this country. They overwhelm the importance of foreign policy on the eve of the November 3rd election. And likewise in China, Tom argues that the elite is really concerned about internal stability, domestic stability, right? The possibility of, of you know, what's happening in Bangkok happening in downtown Shanghai, right? Uh, and then we get into this very difficult effort to understand is the elite more nationalist than the masses or are the masses so nationalist that the elite, which really is very cosmopolitan and internationalist has to cater them, uh, has to cater to them lest they get out of hand, right? And, and who knows at that point, I just, I just nod and uh, you know have another cup of coffee. <laughs> um you know, it's interesting that you brought up the role of um, domestic politics there, Don, because another thing that comes out very clearly in the chapters, particularly in the chapters on Southeast Asian countries, the chapter on Cambodia, right, by Daniel O'Neill, what is in the win-win uh, relationship between Cambodia and China. And it's very clear that what is in it from the Cambodian interest is not economic development for the citizens of Cambodia, but political support for a strong man uh, and the crony capitalists and others around him, that it's really all about regime survival and the um, economic interests of the specific uh, folks at the top, which is a very kind of depressing story. Um, and there can be other, uh, that issue comes out in the chapter on Indonesia a bit as well. And what I also found very interesting um, in the chapter by uh, Zhu Yuenhan and his colleagues is they made the point that to the extent that Southeast Asian countries are economically dependent on China, even though Ann Booth um, critiques that notion, that this is the only place in the world where countries are dependent on an authoritarian state for economic benefits within a supposedly globalized liberal economic world. Right. And that it really does create you know, incentives against the promotion of democracy, liberalism values, what have you. And it really does serve to help entrench some very unsavory regimes um, in Cambodia and Myanmar uh, and others as well. And 
I guess maybe I don't think globally comparatively enough, but I certainly thought that that was a very interesting point. And it goes beyond this notion of a, the Beijing consensus versus the Washington consensus and really focuses in on these domestic aspects, particularly at a time in COVID when we're seeing protests uh, in so many of these countries for very different reasons, the Philippines, Indonesia, Thailand. Um, I'm just curious if you think domestic politics in any of these countries could play out in a way that would have large impacts on Southeast Asian views and responses to China? Well, I think the answer is yes, provided China doesn't play its cards right, provided the dragon is uh, a little less clever than I would imagine it to be. Let me give you a precise illustration. A week ago, Wang Yi, the foreign minister of China, arrived in Bangkok. Now, Bangkok uh, is, you know, in trouble. I mean, <laughs> the demonstrations in the streets uh, have not uh, lessened uh, numerically or in terms of their intense kind of, uh, you know, I mean, who would have thought uh, that there would be demonstrations in Bangkok based on utter disregard for the king of Thailand, Vajira Longkorn, Mahavajira Longkorn. I mean, and we're, I don't want to get into the details of his particular biography, which are salacious and, you know, Hollywood in the extreme, uh, except to say that these students are braving laws that are, you know, based on the Les Majeste rule, thou shalt not criticize the king, that put them in extreme jeopardy. So here comes Wang Yi. And what does he do? He says to his counterpart, uh, <laughs> the prime minister, the result of a coup in 2014, he says to his, his counterpart, um, he says, I would like to propose that we take your Eastern Economic Corridor, which is a, 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 an infrastructure project uh, in the vital deltaic zone in the southern part, southeastern part of Thailand, and we bring it to connect with the greater Bay Area. And as someone who lives in San Francisco, <laughs> you know, every time I think of the greater Bay Area, I have to stop myself and no, 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 that's not Berkeley. <laughs> no, that's not Berkeley. You know, that's Hong Kong, Macau, right? <laughs> And in other words, we are going to help you integrate into the Belt and Road Initiative, right? The larger infrastructural scheme that we are planning. Now that involves reliance on a dictator, reliance on the power that he has uh, to be able to say, yes, yes, we will commit money to this and we will cooperate and thank you very much. And we would like some of your money as well and so forth and so on, right? Now, in fact, if you look at what has happened to the negotiations, just to take that example between Thailand and China with regard to the BRI, you have to come to the conclusion, in my opinion, that actually China, uh, sorry, Thailand has in some respects behaved very much like the idealized image of the mouse deer. For example, postponing. Well, you know, we'd love to talk about that. That's a very interesting proposal. You know, we've got a really busy schedule. Maybe we could do that. You know, actually next month is not gonna work either, right? Now, you know, I'm perhaps exaggerating a little bit how important that is, but when you put off someone who is trying to impose upon you an arrangement that is not in your interest, it is a standard and only ostensibly polite way of getting out from it, right? Or how Thailand responded when China came in and said, oh, by the way, you know, we're gonna help you build the railroad. In fact, we are gonna build the railroad and they bring in their own labor, which annoys obviously a lot of unemployed Thais who would like the jobs. We're gonna do that for you, but in return, we would like a chunk of land on either side of the railroad where we can do whatever we want. We can take advantage, we can set up shops and whatever it might be, right? And rather than giving in on that, uh, the Thais responded with some significant concern uh, to that proposal. So I could go on. Now, obviously these arrangements take, take place behind closed doors. I don't have access. And again, there's always, always the risk of romanticizing the mouse deer. I'm trying not to do that. But I think the, the connection you point out is real and it could make a real difference either for a successful 
sort of institutionalization of autocratic rule. Let's remember that not, you know, there's only one country in Southeast Asia that is classified as free in terms of civil liberties and political liberties in Southeast Asia, only one. And it's not a member of ASEAN, that's Timor-Leste. The best you can find inside ASEAN is countries that are partly free, which means that the impulse towards a more autocratic regime is alive. It may not be completely well, but it's not dead either. And there are those domestically who are pushing it forward, right? And you and I know examples, Indonesia comes to mind. So yes, there is a connection there. And I always, I always regretted conversations, frankly, to be perfectly honest, without being critical of my colleagues who specialize on, on China. But every now and then at a conference, I would get the impression, oh, people would say to me, people who speak Chinese, who go to China, who know China, oh, no, 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 Don, China is not trying to impose its authoritarian model on anyone. China is promiscuous. If you're a democracy, we work with you. If you're an authoritarian regime, we work with you also. My answer to that is empirically, yes, that's, that's right. It's not like the bad old days when you know, Mao Zedong was exporting the great proletarian cultural revolution to Southeast Asia. No, no, not at all. However, the consequences of China's working closely with authoritarian regimes in Southeast Asia on, for example, economic matters, in fact, reinforces the inequality, reinforces uh, the authoritarian character of the system and leaves it up to the streets uh, in Bangkok the students in the streets in Bangkok to try to do something about it. I think it's fascinating what's happening in Bangkok as well. I was there for two months last year and the idea that you could have thousands of people on the street protesting the monarchy was unthinkable at that point. So it does illustrate how quickly things uh, uh, do change. Um, one last comment and then we'll open it up for Q&A um, on this issue of you know, kind of China and supporting um, authoritarian leaning states, um, particularly a couple of weeks uh, before a US election where I think many people are hoping for a change. One of the things that struck me as very interesting was John Chiorciari's chapter um, on China and the Northern Tier or mainland Southeast Asia, right? China's relationship with Myanmar, Laos, Cambodia, Thailand, and, and Vietnam. And he titled it Distance and Dominance, which I really like the alliteration with the Ds, but more important, he made the argument that in part, China's growing dominance in mainland Southeast Asia is a function of US distance, not just in the geographical sense, right? That the US is half an ocean away, but in the policy sense, in the fact that the US has been missing in action uh, quite a while, and also that the US policy has often tended to privilege, if we think of foreign policy as, you know, economic security and um, values buckets, that very often it's privileged values, condemnation of Hun Sen, condemnation of the Taikus, condemnation of Vietnam's uh, lack of religious freedom and other things. And that this then creates a backlash on by the parts of Southeast Asian states against US uh, policy intervention, and that this just creates greater opportunities for China to exert its dominance, which raises, of course, the question, what is the possibility of, A, more attention on Southeast Asia in a post-election administration, if there is a change, and number two, whether or not there will be a recognition of the potential trade-offs between a kind of values uh, set of interests and a set of security and political set of interests. Um, so if you have any comments on that, Don, I'd love to hear them. Yeah, well, <clears throat> right. I wish we could have a whole program on you know, <laughs> American foreign policy after the 20th of January, you know that would be that would be really fun. Uh, but let me let me respond with a single word: compartmentalization. Now, you know, 
I am affiliated here at Stanford with the Center on Democracy, Development, and the Rule of Law. And I support all three of those things, democracy, development, and the rule of law. Don't misunderstand. Nevertheless, it is pragmatic and convenient uh, to have a bit of a two-track <clears throat> approach. <clears throat> Consider, for example, the remarkably warm relations between Washington and Hanoi. Really quite remarkable. Uh, we could spend a lot of time talking about that. And yet, we know, in fact, uh, opponents of the regime, quote unquote, I, I shouldn't use that term, I should say critics of the regime, have been arrested, jailed. Uh, this is an authoritarian regime, solidly autocratic, right? Uh, you know, Leninism is alive and well and living in Hanoi, uh, maybe under the, under the guise of Vietnamese nationalism, perhaps, but still. So compartmentalization, it seems to me, is the obvious answer. And furthermore, the deer are smart enough to know that that's what's happening, that there will be a necessary obligatory sort of uh, reference gesture made uh, at the official level, at the track one level, okay, in the direction of, well, you know, we really wish you would do this or that. And it's typically done behind closed doors. Unless, of course, in the case, let's say, of Cambodia or Laos, that's different, right? I mean, Cambodia is so evidently uh, an authoritarian system that, you know, and, and frankly, relations with Cambodia have gotten worse on other grounds as well. So there's no, there's no double track there at the moment that I can think of. There used to be one, and maybe there's a remnant of one. Uh, so that, it seems to me, is, uh, is, is, is the answer. Now, when we talk about track three, where you and I belong, academics, people who have no power. Well, I mean, okay, very little power, right? Or even track two, right? The, the hybrids who move back and forth. And some of us are hybrids, maybe I'm a hybrid, you know, who, who maybe talk with officials and then, you know, write obscure and unintelligible academic books at the same time, right? But when, it, when you get into track two and especially track three, that's different. And the problem here is that in a globalized world, those tracks matter more and more, other things be equal. Diplomacy is not just something that the foreign minister does or the secretary of state, foreign policy is affected and even perhaps invented uh, by all kinds of people uh, who are coming up with ideas and so forth, including movements that are committed morally to defend democracy, to defend the freedom of speech that, uh, you know, that is in some way still despite the occupant in the White House, uh, a significant basis for, for American identity. We're talking about identity here. Now that's a much more serious challenge to the authoritarian regimes in Southeast Asia. And so how the Americans at the track one level deal with that, and we'll see after the 20th of January, whether there will be a greater inclination, if you will, not just to deal in terms of the two tracks, but to encourage the second track insofar as it is occupied by people in Amnesty International, I could go on and on, the human rights organizations that matter so much morally, ethically, and in terms of at least what remains to be the basis, I think, of American identity. Okay, at this point, I'd like to uh, turn it over to Margo Landman. She's gonna handle the Q&A, Margo. Yep, thank you, Anne-Marie, and thank you, Don, for a really terrific, thoughtful, provocative conversation. I do have to correct you on one thing, Don. This is not an obscure academic book. It is very accessible, really well written. It's very readable. So audience members, please don't be scared off by that characterization. We have many really interesting questions that have come in. And I'm gonna start with one that follows from the most, the, the last comment you made on the US role. It comes in from Dr. Aram Ashraf, who writes, what kind of role does the US play in the lack of unity found among ASEAN states against China? Is it US availability as security provider in the region which hinders it as they can then focus on their individual concerns. Does this then help China indirectly as they, that they can then impose negative control over the region? I think that's for Don. Wow. 
what was the name of the individual? Ash Ashraf? Uh, yeah. Well, Ashraf. But I'm sorry, I'm using your, your first name. I apologize. That's a terrific question. Um, it, 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 I don't mean this as a criticism, although it could be taken that way, but it's a very academic question. <laughs> Remember, the adjective means two things. It means people like me, for better or worse, right? <laughs> and Anne-Marie. But also, it means so incredibly complicated that it parts company with, with reality. I mean, the argument here would be based on a prediction, which seems to me entirely fallacious, that if the United States stopped providing security help to the countries of Southeast Asia, that then China would suddenly shift back into permanent smile diplomacy and would not use any sort of uh, pressures, would not intimidate. You know, I could go through the list of the, of the tactics that China uses. Uh, uh, to browbeat uh, Southeast Asians, to intimidate them, and so forth, and to, it's it's a little bit like, <clears throat> well, there's an American policymaker whom I won't uh, mention, who really seriously argues that the only reason China is behaving badly in Southeast Asia is because of the American naval FONOPS, the freedom of navigation operations in the South China Sea. That's absurd. That's completely absurd. China has long claimed the South China Sea. It outdates, uh, predates, right? Uh, the FONOPS. I mean, there are historical reasons. Uh, Bill Hayton has a wonderful book that's just coming out called The Invention of China, which I highly recommend. And he is a leading expert on the history of China's claims in the South China Sea, which frankly have nothing to do with FONOPS. FONOPS is a very recent development in that regard. And so I think it is, forgive me for being harsh, I think it is entirely naive to suggest that if the United States stopped supporting the countries of Southeast Asia, everything would be peaches and cream and uh, peace would reign and so forth and so on. That it seems is utterly naive. Now, there's a separate question which he did not ask, which in some ways is much more interesting. And that is, what is a provocative assistance, right? Uh, to what extent, I mean, in a way you could say this happens with regard to US policy toward Taiwan. We support Taiwan in many respects, but we, we don't wanna be so provocative as to trigger uh, an invasion by, tai, by China of uh, Taiwan. Now, what is provocative, American provocation in a Southeast Asian context? Frankly, what I say is, what I see rather, is evidence in the South China Sea, massive evidence of Chinese provocation. Southeast Asians know that the United States is never going to want to control, either in a positive or a negative sense, Southeast Asia. No, precisely because of the distance that John Shorchari points out so eloquently in his chapter. Yeah, we are far removed. In fact, the problem for Southeast Asians <clears throat> is not, you know, you're another elephant, you're trampling, and the Chinese are trampling, please stop trampling. No, the Americans are too far away to trample. They're not interested in trample. The, pro the problem is exactly the opposite. If you're indifferent, right, if you're absent, why didn't you show up at the East Asia Summit? Why aren't you coming here? What, we, need, what, what, we need you to show up so that we can balance China. That's the operative. Related to that, we have several questions asking about Northeast Asian countries. One comes from Jacqueline Hicks, who says, where is Japan in all of this? Does it help balance out China's influence in Southeast Asia? Another one is also on Japan. What role might Japan play? This is from Ken, but I don't know Ken's last name. It only says Ken. What role might Japan play in building a stronger alliance in Southeast Asia to constrain uh, China? And then the next one is from Barbara Seneco. I hope I'm pronouncing her last name right of the European Institute for Asian Studies in Brussels. She says, considering the Chinese foreign minister's descri description of China as a big country and the ASEAN states as small countries, the 2010 statement, what is the role of middle powers in the China in China ASEAN relations and the South China Sea? For example, Korea has endorsed the AOIP. Well, you know, that's a fabulous question, and that would be the, that should be the subject of a whole new webinar, not with me, but with somebody who knows what he's talking about. I mean, that is a fabulous question, and frankly, the omission of the middle powers, so-called, 
from the kind of binary discussion of the US versus China and Southeast Asia versus China and so forth, that has been lamentable. <clears throat> and it has prevented us from thinking creati creatively and clearly about the broader situation. Now, it's quite clear that in the negotiations, for example, for a code of conduct on the South China Sea, Beijing has been quite explicit. They would like included in the text, basically to ban the involvement of outsiders in the South China Sea. They want to deal with the Southeast Asians on their own and not involve the outsiders, right? Uh, conversely, it seems to me increasingly <clears throat> in Southeast Asia, there is not only an acceptance, but a kind of welcoming of the involvement of outside middle powers, right? Um, and of course, here we get a lot of alphabet soup, right? Uh, we get the quad and people are talking about the quad plus, right? I mean, I'm struck that Australia has now been allowed back into Malabar by the Indians, right? Into the exercise, the military exercise in the Indian Ocean. Uh, that's, you know, because there was a problem previously. So that's an example of how the alphabet soup, it, it's not, in that case, it's not a, it's a squad. It just simply means the four, the four countries, right? That I'm sure you're familiar with the United States and <clears throat> Japan and India and uh, Australia, but there are other arrangements. And let me talk about Japan. Japan right now is the most popular outsider in Southeast Asia of any of the major countries, of any of the middle countries, right? Compared to either China or the United States. So Japan has a real opportunity. The Southeast Asians have forgotten about World War II with regard to Japan. Even in the Philippines, the Bataan Death March, forget it, that's archival, right? So there is a real opportunity for Tokyo under Suga, under the new administration, to yes, to, to really become a far more active player, not just in defense and military terms, but in other terms as well. And Japan is already extremely important economically in terms of FDI, for example, actual uh, investment in Southeast Asia. Now, you know, <clears throat> I should confess, watashi wa Tokyo de umaremashita, right? And those of you that understand what that means will know that, you know, I have to be careful here. I do have, uh, it's tucked into my biography, right? Uh, Japan, and I have tremendous regard for, I love the country. Uh, and also the leadership. And hopefully under Suga, we will get precisely what it seems to me is needed, which is a more proactive policy coming out of, of Tokyo. And just to give you one example, to go back to the, to, to the contrast between sort of economic help and, and democracy. Well, one way of kind of smuggling in, not exactly smuggling democracy, but smuggling in integrity, right? Honesty, uh, and also perhaps then in introducing the notion that top-down dictatorships really are more likely to be corrupt than otherwise, right, is the notion of a quality infrastructure that's associated with Japanese foreign policy. And they, I think they, 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 have a they have a wide open opportunity. The door is wide open for them to increasingly in Southeast Asia advise Southeast Asians on how they can prevent the manipulation to the extent that it's involved in the way China is selling uh, the Belt and Road Initiative in Southeast Asia. Now, India is different. Uh, we could spend a lot of time talking about India. It has domestic preoccupations, especially now with COVID-19. We haven't discussed that. My view, incidentally, is that COVID-19 is also, despite the rapid recovery of China in the long run, possibly posing difficulties for China to be able to maintain the kind of active BRI policy all the way to Europe, incredibly expansive, and will they be able to keep that up? I think that's a, that's a question mark. But I completely agree, Japan, Australia, India, the outside powers should be involved more and more in Southeast Asia. And I think uh, the Southeast Asians themselves are certainly willing for that to happen. I remember years ago, the debate between the Indian position, we have to be neutral, and the Singaporean position, no. No, 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 we want everybody, including the big guys. If you have an enemy, the best thing to do is bring him inside the tent. Let's bring the Chinese in, the Americans, everybody in. Now the Singaporeans won that debate. That's what's actually happening in Southeast Asia and that's what should happen, including the involvement of China in terms that are you know, beneficial to everybody concerned. And the last thing I will say is this, and I'm, I'm talking too much, but forgive me, I apologize. But I wanna say one other thing. It disturbs me that as far as I know, the Americans and the Chinese have never gotten together, at least to my knowledge, and said, okay, what are your bottom lines? What are your true national interests in Southeast Asia? And we'll tell you ours. I mean, you know, for example, 
uh, I, I do remember, um, you know, talking with a former American diplomat uh, at one point and saying, yeah, why don't we have core interests in Southeast Asia? You know, I teach Southeast Asia. If a student asked me, well, you know, what do we want? And I said, well, well, I, I guess we want peace and access for American firms. I mean, I, I, I don't know, right? And the answer came, no, you know, no, no, core interest. You're talking about core interest. That's a Chinese term. We don't want to have core interest. That's a that's a term that they use. We don't want to use the same term. And I'm thinking to myself, what, what do you get a problem with language? I mean, call call it something else, right? Bottom lines. Call it bottom lines. That sounds good, especially in a capitalist economy, right? Call it bottom lines. What are our bottom lines? What are China's bottom lines? I don't know. Following up on diplomacy, we have a question from a former American diplomat, Larry Dax not related to what you were just talking about. What do you see as the role, if any, of ethnic Chinese in the various Southeast Asian countries in China-Southeast Asian relations? That is a fascinating, relevant, and sensitive question. It's sensitive because the overseas Chinese in Southeast Asia and I have to put that in quotation marks because I won't go into it now. Many of you may know this already, but there is a, a, a humongous debate over what you call the overseas Chinese in Southeast Asia, right? Uh, depending upon whether they've been there for generations or maybe they're citizens of the People's Republic of China that have come in more, more recently and so forth. So obviously we do not in any way want to descend into statements that would implicate race as a driver of anything, policy, uh, you know, aspersions, uh, and so forth. We don't want to do that. Okay, um, and and I and I could I could I could follow that further, but let me just leave that there. But the problem is that we have to be able to talk about a phenomenon, right? And the phenomenon is real. That. There are people, the United Front Work Department in Beijing is interested in instrumentalizing the diaspora in Southeast Asia, right? The millions of, of ethnic Chinese uh, who are probably, you know, don't speak a word of Mandarin, let alone maybe one that they've even forgotten some local language if they ever learned it to begin with, right? And so they have no connection with uh, China, right? Uh, for all I know, uh, but they are loyal citizens of the local governments uh, of the local country in, in Southeast Asia, right? And yet, from time to time, in the rhetoric coming out of Beijing, one gets the sense that there is a kind of vision of a greater, of an ethnic China, or to put it differently, of a racial China, that we're all part of one family. Now, that's okay. As long as the person in Thailand or the Philippines or Indonesia that you're talking about, as long as he really or she wants to become part of that larger family, that's different, right? That has to do with individual rights, as long as they don't violate the laws of the country that they're living in, right? Um, but a lot of the people in Southeast Asia, arguably the vast majority, in my opinion, who have been there a long time, have developed identities that are not partial identities in the sense of, well, yeah, I'm here, but my heart is in China. No, no, no. You know, one of the most disturbing comments that can be made about the overseas Chinese, which it seems to me is on the, on the face of it false, is that these are somehow guests, right? As if a guest could be here for maybe five or 10 years and then go home again, right? No, I mean, that, that's, uh, that's completely invidious, right? So there is a chapter in the book despite the sensitivity, in fact, in a way, because of it, because it needs to be discussed, because academics and others presumably can try to be objective about this and not have any kind of racial aspersions involved whatsoever. And that's by Jeff uh, Wade. Uh, and he documents the efforts by China to co-opt, to turn the overseas Chinese into supporters of Chinese foreign policy, into, if you will, kind of ambassadors with a lowercase a, for the People's Republic of China. Now, the immediate thing to be said is if you read that chapter, you'll find if you look back on it that, you know, actually this hasn't done really well. This has not been terribly successful. The dragon has not really managed to, you know, co-opt these um, sort of so-called, right, genetically different, ha ha, not true at all, deer uh, on its behalf. Uh, and I guess from my point of view, I have to say this, I think that's good. I think that's good. I mean, if, if a Chinese 
um, if an ethnic Chinese Southeast Asian, you know, wants to support the PRC, that's fine. That's fine. That's especially if it's a democracy, it would be easier for them to do that. But we also know in Southeast Asia that there have been pogroms against the Chinese, right? Uh, I first went to Indonesia in 1967, and, and, and what happened to the Chinese in terms of the transition from Suharto uh, to the de democracy that succeeded him is absolutely appalling. Hundred, hundreds of thousands of people died. Now, they were not all Chinese. In fact, the proportion that were Chinese is less than the demographic proportion of Chinese in Indonesia at that time. Nevertheless, it wasn't so much that the Chinese were, were murdered and their bodies were thrown into the river, although that did happen, but rather it was that they were intimidated into giving up their wealth because the identification of the Chinese often in Southeast Asia, you know, kind of based on, I suppose you could talk about the Jews of Asia, right? Is that they, because of the colonial system and the way the colonial system privileged them by giving them certain positions, right? As, as tax farmers, for example, and you can keep the, keep the change, so to speak, right? This is a very, very difficult problem. And I don't want to make it any worse, but I do think that we have to acknowledge it, including acknowledging China's effort to use the overseas Chinese on its own behalf. Thank you. We have two questions about Thailand, um, maybe for Anne-Marie. One is from Mike Lampton. Where does Thailand fit in the spectrum of capacity to maintain its autonomy slash agency as China grows? And the other one is from Jeff Moon. What is China's position regarding the current unrest in Thailand? And does China have any significant interests or role in the outcome? Um, I'm happy to take those questions, although I'm sure Don has, uh, has some uh, comments uh, as well. Um, you know, Thailand has a lot of agency in terms of technocratic capacity, in terms of alternative um, partners, both economic and security, right? Thailand is a major non-NATO ally of the US. That is a relationship that is in search of a new meaning. Uh, Thailand has really chosen to distance itself from the US, uh, deny many US requests, uh, whether it be for base access or other things in recent years. If Thailand really wanted to use some of that agency in order to enhance its autonomy vis-a-vis -vis China, it could. Now, part of the reason, and ditto on the economics, right? I mean, China, Thailand uh, has an extremely strong industrial base, very, very different from many of the other mainland Southeast Asian countries. Um, the Japanese auto industry is very significant there. Japan is a key economic and well-liked actor. So on the economic and security side, Thailand has agency, it has well-educated people, it has a foreign ministry and staff of well-trained uh, diplomats and others that quite frankly have been so politicized in the last decade or so that it has really diminished Thailand's own uh, long history of kind of bending with the wind or retaining its strategic autonomy. And I think part of that, and this gets to the question of um, does China have an issue in the current uh, um, protests and things? The answer is yes. I mean, China is extremely tied into the current military elite. It is a key supporter of the Prayut regime and uh, all of the military supporters. When um, the US and other Western countries really criticized the 2014 coup, they looked to China for both political support international legitimization, as well as military assets. And China was only too happy to provide it. If you look at many of the protesters, you hear talk about this milk tea alliance, right? Between many of the young Thai protesters who empathize with their Hong Kong uh, counterparts. Many of them are very, 
upset at the way in which they view their country having been sold out a bit, their opinions on foreign policy would likely be different. Part of it's generational, but part of it is also the way that Chinese support has upheld a regime that they view as suppressing their interests. How this all plays out is unpredictable, um, but that would be my take on the topic. I don't know if Don has a different one. Don, would you like to add anything? Oh, no, I agree with what you said. I agree with what you said. Okay. This will be the last question. I think I would like each of you to address it quickly because we only have a few more minutes left. It comes from Dan Krasenstein and it is a U.S. focused question. In the next two weeks before the U.S. election occurs, which would be the most likely hotspot for China major military confrontation? A, Taiwan, B, Vietnam, C, India, or D, other. Also, would the U.S. under President Trump encourage it as a distraction? God forbid that <laughs> President Trump would encourage it as a distraction. Uh, I'm not even sure he's capable of doing that because that, that requires, speaking of mouse deer and you know, foxy behavior, that requires cleverness that I don't think he has. In answer to the earlier part of the question, I would say this. Um, well, first of all, of course, I have no idea. <laughs> That's important. But if it were to happen, and I, God forbid, I hope it won't, it would not be a full-scale invasion of Taiwan. But it might be something a little different. There are tiny little islets off the coast of China, off the coast of the People's Republic of China, <laughs> that could be encircled, right, to make a point. Uh, you know, now I, I'm hoping that doesn't happen. Uh, it would be extremely unfortunate. The logic behind it would presumably be that someone in Beijing figures, look, the United States is eating its own entrails, right? Uh, it's, it's totally bound up in, in its own domestic agony. So this is a good time to do something that is in the gray zone, not bad enough to trigger a counter, counter move by the United States, but just enough to remind them of our capacity. Uh, that would be my 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 answer. And but I think it will happen. I don't. Th I think it's unlikely. I, I really think it's unlikely. I, I'm. I agree with Don that this is in the realm of speculation, and that I really hope it doesn't happen. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, thank you both very much for a really terrific program. I know I learned a lot and I'm sure our audience has learned a great deal also. I encourage people to get a hold of the book, whether or not you're going to a local bookstore or ordering it online. It is really fascinating. And as Anne-Marie said at the beginning, it truly hangs together in ways that many edited volumes do not. So thanks very much to both of you. And I would like to end with a plug for some of the committee's upcoming programs. We have a lot of them. Mm -hmm. Next Monday, one with Eric Heikola of USC on his new book, China from a US Policy Perspective. On Tuesday evening, our time, Maggie Lewis, uh, Seton Hall Law School professor, and Shelley Rigger of Davidson College on U.S.-Taiwan relations. And the following Monday, November 2nd, Scott Rosell, your colleague at Stanford, on his book, Invisible China, How the Urban-Rural Divide Threatens China's Rise. And Tin Gao of Columbia will be the commentator. So thank you again for joining us today, and I hope you will come back in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you for having us. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Anne-Marie. You too. Thank you very much. Thanks, Tom.